the challenge, the opportunity to connect. The 1960s, a time of imagination and change, a time of anger and fear. The 1960s, a program called Challenge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of faith. Nearly 60 years later, during these challenging times, we'll take a new look at our divisions, our connections, in a new program called Challenge 2.0. Religious freedom motivated most, if not all, of the early American immigrants, and many experienced profound discrimination, if not outright hostility, because they had different beliefs. Yet efforts to make public spaces religion neutral have become highly controversial, if not also emotionally fraught. One example is to simply say, happy holidays, as opposed to saying, Merry Christmas. Americans who identify as agnostics, atheists, or secular humanists have been strong supporters of such efforts. What have their perspectives, what have their experiences been? That's the topic of this edition of Challenge 2.0. And we're fortunate today to have uh, two guests with us that can give us a, a real perspective uh, on this particular issue or set of issues. We have Nick Fish, who's the president of American Atheists. Nick, thank you very much for joining us from Cranford, New Jersey, I understand. Happy to be here. Thanks so much. And locally from Edmonds, Washington, we have Judy Gladstone. Uh, Judy, thank you very much for joining us as well. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here. So it might be helpful as we begin uh, just to get a sense of definition, and that is, how do you define atheism or secular humanism? What exactly do those terms mean to you? Yeah, I'm happy to start with the, uh, the question on atheism, because I think it's uh, something that's often misunderstood by folks, um, that it's it's they think it's making a claim that we're saying that because uh, we don't believe in God, that we're assume, asserting something else. The way that American atheists defines atheism is the lack of a belief in God. Um, now, this is not a theological definition. This is a practical definition that is the way that most people use these things. Uh, but I will say that there's this, uh, the, it, when you survey people in the United States, there's a difference between how people will say, will answer the question, do you believe in God? And about 10% of people will say no. But if you ask people, are they atheists? Only about four or 5% of people will say that they're atheists. So we want to use as expansive a definition as possible while still acknowledging that people have rightly or wrongly some misgivings about the word atheists. And so one of the things that we work very hard to do is destigmatize that label, encourage people to use that label, um, even if it is difficult sometimes, uh, we want people to use an accurate word and the word that, frankly, most people understand. Um, but that self-identity thing can be very complicated. It's not just like a, a dictionary. Uh, and so, you know, th there's a lot wrapped up in that word, and I wouldn't, won't pretend it's an easy thing for everybody. Uh, but, you know, that that's the simple definition for us. It's the lack of a belief in God. That's it. Uh, nothing more complicated than that. And Judy, what's your understanding? And um... Where do you fall on that? So secular humanistic Judaism, which is what I participate in for um, my community, is, is also rooted in non-theism in not believing in God. But added to that is the belief that humans create the morals, humans create the path, and we rely on each other as uh, where we turn to for our help rather than to some theistic being. And in some respects, um, one of the founders of humanistic Judaism, Sherwin Wine, Rabbi Sherwin Wine, he coined a term called agnosticism. In other words, it doesn't matter. So some people may participate in secular humanistic Judaism, and maybe they do have a belief in God, but it doesn't matter to them. There's no prayers to God. There's no turning to a deity for help or anything like that. It's really looking to human beings to define what that morality is and to define and, and, and provide look for assistance. So, Carl Sagan has been uh, at least associated as an atheist. And I guess I, I'd ask both of you for your take on that. He has been quoted as saying that an absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence, suggesting maybe that there's a bit of a spectrum. Uh, so I might ask you, number one, uh, was uh, Professor, the late Professor Sagan, an atheist in your view? And 
is there a bit of a spectrum in the range of people that you deal with, both with your group locally, Judy, and with yours nationally, Nick? So I, I would say there is a spectrum because I think that for some people, like I said, they don't really care. It's not even something that they think about. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't just doesn't matter and whether or not there exists a God. And then there's people who are adamant that there does not exist you know, there is no uh, God at all. And then, of course, you have the agnostics who believe, well, maybe there is, I'll hedge my bets, maybe there aren't. And so it can really, I think about it as um, a real spectrum. Mm -hmm. Nick, what's your experience? And I believe you have a convention coming up uh, shortly as we're taping this. Uh, do you see a fair amount of range of orientation in that as well? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, as far as Carl Sagan goes, you know, I, he's quoted a few times saying, you know, the, the label atheist was maybe too certain for him or, you know, went a little bit further than he was comfortable. But I'm, I'm, we're a lot more interested in how people live their lives and sort of where the rubber meets the road. He, he was sort of leaving the possibility open, I suppose, and again, projecting a, a level of certainty onto the label atheist that isn't, I don't know that is necessarily there. He certainly lived his life in such a way that he lacked a belief in God. Maybe he didn't believe that there is no God, which is sort of a subtle difference, but, you know, an important one. But, you know, we're getting into, kind of get into, uh, you know, pedantry a little bit when we're talking about this. But I think Judy would probably know this a little bit, would know this well for our community that we agree on like 95% of things. Uh, and the 5% of disagreement comes along with labels. And then that 5% is what historically people spent about 95% of their time arguing about. Um, and so we're much more interested in finding common ground and, and working together. And, you know, I'm not going to force any that label onto anyone. But at our events, when people come to our conference, um, that's uh, this upcoming Easter weekend uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, um, you know, we have people from all over the spectrum. We have people who take a strong atheist position, like I reject the, the notion that there is a God. They'll take a slightly more narrow vision. I reject the notion that there is a Christian God or the God that's described in the Bible or the Quran or any other holy book. And then we have people who don't even think about it. They don't move through their life, their day-to-day -day life, thinking every day, every moment about, oh, you know, I wonder if there's a God or not. They're just good people living good lives who, as Judy said, uh, believe in the notion that there are human solutions to human problems. And we have to lean on one another to find, uh, to find the solutions there. Um, and that's, that's, that's the thing that binds us all together, that if we take this seriously, then it's on us to make the world a better place. Uh, and that's a really powerful acknowledgement, I think, that, that we can control uh, to a large extent what's happening and the things that we can't, you know, uh, it's not in God's hands. It's just sometimes the universe is pretty random and that's uh, an unfortunate truth. But, you know, the fact that it's uncomfortable doesn't change the fact that it's true. Nick, you mentioned uh, the issue of labels. And I think one of the problems that we face, particularly in this society uh, in the year 2022 and have for the last couple of years, is we tend to try to acquaint ourselves with a label we can affix to somebody rather than their human experience and what led them on a given path. Would you be comfortable sharing how you ended up moving to embrace atheism? And then, uh, Judy, I'd ask you the same question in terms of secular humanism. Sure. So for me, and this is a common experience for a lot of people in my generation, is I was not raised in a particularly religious household. Um, and that's, that's becoming a more common experience for millions and millions of millennials and Gen Z people, so even younger than me, um, that they're just not raised in, in this environment. Um, and that having been said, for even people who are raised in religious households for, these, for those generations, uh, you know, Generation Z, X, and, e, and millennials, uh, they, they leave religion. And they often leave religion even before they reach adulthood. Some of them leave in college. You know, and, and, and so that's a really common experience for people. Um, for me, it was more getting the, the language to describe what I was already feeling. Um, so I was never a particularly religious person. I, I never really believed in God in the, in the way that people would, you know, would describe. I was certainly never religious. I can probably count on one hand the number of times I attended church as a church service and not as like a funeral, a wedding, something like that. Um, and so getting the, the, the language to describe that, learning more about the history of free thought, the history of the, the phil philosophical underpinnings of atheism, agnosticism, comparative religion, all that in college was really formative for me in terms of, uh, again, just actually <laughs> accurately describing what I was already feeling. Um, and so it wasn't so much a journey for me to atheism as it was just having 
that ability to, you know, anchor my, my beliefs or my lack of beliefs in that history, finding a belief system that did, you know, more closely hew to, to what I was believing, which by the way, humanism, I will gladly, you know, grab that label for myself as well. I am an atheist who is also a secular humanist. Uh, you know, that th these things are not mutually exclusive. And I, and I think that's one of the most important things that we, we have to be clear about when, when talking about this is that they're not warring factions here. <laughs> you know, we're not, there's no Pope of atheism or Pope of humanism telling you that you can't be both or you can't be bits and pieces. And, you know, a very common thing, especially for, you know, million, there are millions of secular Jews out there that are in exactly the same position who value, and Judy can certainly speak better to this, you know, value the cultural aspects of Judaism without some of the religious and supernatural baggage that goes with it. And so, you know, that, that for me, the, less of a journey, more of a, journey to understanding, I guess, uh, than a journey away from or toward any particular belief. So Judy, what about your experience? Yeah, so Nick really hit it right on, on the head because I grew up in a Jewish household and uh, it was not a religious Jewish household. It was one where I lived amongst all Jews and I played with Jewish kids. So to me, being Jewish was not about going to synagogue. It was about the people that I was with. Mm -hmm. And when I moved to Seattle from the big Jewish community I was in in Detroit and started having children, I realized that if I don't do something proactively with my children, they don't have that same experience of being amongst their people. And I needed to create that. So I did a little exploring and decided, well, I'm going to start doing Shabbat every Friday. Well, then I started looking at the blessings and then I interpreted them as like, wait a minute, I, I can't say this because I don't believe in it, but I want that cultural practice of observing some things that were really relevant to me and meaningful when I grew up, even if I didn't agree with the liturgy that was associated to it. So then I discovered secular humanistic Judaism that was actually, um, its origins are in Detroit, Michigan, oddly enough, um, and um, started researching that more and more and realizing what that offered me was the ability to immerse myself in my cultural expressions with a liturgy that matched my beliefs. And so I could have integrity with my expression. So for example, my kids had a mitzvahs and they did not read Torah portions. They did not say the blessings. Instead, they took some readings and they did interpretations of, of what the lessons we learned as human beings and we're able to go through a lot of the rituals that I find very rich and meaningful, but in a meaningful way, both with their words as well as their actions. So for me, it was a discovery in my adulthood and wanting to pass along my Jewish peopleness to my children with a liturgy that matched what our beliefs were. As I've heard both of you talk, you've discuss the need for people to recognize that they need to be the ones coming up with solutions, that they need to deal with the problems facing us uh, as a nation, a world, as a planet. Uh, yet occasionally you hear people assert that atheists don't have values. Uh, has that been your experience? And what do you say to such people? I think that the most important thing to say there is uh, just sort of to push back, obviously, uh, when you when you look at the data about where atheists and, and non-religious people in general stand on a whole host of issues, whether it's, you know, caring about uh, immigrants who are fleeing violence, whether it's, you know, a, 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 an acknowledgement that religious pluralism and, and pluralism in general makes our nation stronger, whether it's an appreciation for fundamental democratic values, um, whether it's you know, views about uh, equality for women, for LGBT people, racial equality, and so on. I mean, just the list sort of goes on and on that non-religious people or atheists, agnostics, non the nuns, quote unquote, um, are far more likely to be supportive of all of those things than the people who are the self-proclaimed defenders of morality in the white evangelical community. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the people who come around and say, well, you know, we're, we, we really value this strict social hierarchy or this racial hierarchy or gender hierarchy and so on. 
Um, and so I, I, I definitely push back on that a lot <laughs> and, and just think it's completely incompatible with my views. Um, but also, you know, if, if the only thing, and this, I, this is a phrase or a, a turn of phrase that's been around for a very long time, if the only thing that's keeping you from murdering or from, you know, from stealing or, or anything else is the fear of punishment by God, that says a lot more about your values than it does about mine. And I think, uh, you know, there's a really great interview. I think it was a Penn Jillette, the, the magician who said, you know, I do exactly the amount of murdering that I want to, and that amount is zero. <laughs> and, I, and even though I'm an atheist, you know, and so like that, it's a really powerful thing to acknowledge that, that again, we're accountable to one another. And that belief that that is the level of accountability that we have, that, that it, it's, it's, we were only forgiven by the grace of our fellow people. Um, and, and we have to make things right if we screw them up. That's a really powerful acknowledgement about, uh, you know, where we stand and, and what morality is, because as Judy said, we're, we're, we're fallible humans, you know, sort of fumbling our way through and, and we have to treat each other as best we can with the acknowledgement that we're going to make mistakes, right? And, and that we have to uh, find human solutions to these human problems and, and, and take it in our hands to fix things. Judy, what's been your experience with that? So I founded the Secular Jewish Circle of Puget Sound about probably about almost 30 years ago now. And we started a Sunday school probably 10 years after we started the organization and had many parents come to us and say, what are my kids going to learn in Sunday school if they're not learning the dictates of what God is telling them they should be, how they should be living their lives? And you know, this is a concept that that's where our ethics and our morality comes from without really looking to us as human beings for how we shape our own worlds. And um, in the conversation I would have with these parents, it's really about um, when they start to understand that as parents, they set rules and they allow their kids to explore and to learn from their mistakes that we as a society and as people do the same thing. If you have to rely on a God in order to enforce it, like Nick said, with punishment, that's gonna be razor thin um, because they're not internalizing those, those ethics and morals in a way that drives them to, to live those ethics and morals from within themselves. And that's a much more powerful compass than saying you have to do it because something external from you is forcing you to do it. So I think that the pushback has to come from other people who share similar values and an appeal to their senses about um, what right and wrong and how strong it is when it comes from within rather than from something that's external to yourself. I think one of the other questions that frequently comes up when we're having this discussion about uh, those who believe in a supreme being, those who do not, is the public arena. Uh, you look back over history, a lot of people that came to this country came, so, came because of the desire to escape religious oppression. Uh, and yet there are a lot that get very... Uh, defensive when they are not able to portray their particular view as the dominant one. Uh, there have been uh, numerous cases in terms of uh, uh, public celebrations on public land and uh, perhaps popularly or unpopularly, uh, atheists and agnostics and secular humanists have been the ones that have said, this is not right to have that on public uh, land or public property. Uh, could you give us a little bit of nuance in terms of what your views are and why you think that's so important for us as a country. One thing to, to just clarify that I think is important that some people don't understand or, or maybe have a, an incorrect impression about, some people didn't come to the United States purely to escape religious persecution. Mm -hmm. Some people came to the United States because the country that they were in wasn't permitting them to engage in religious persecution themselves. <laughs> and so they came to the United States to set up sort of a, a, a I mean, the, the original colonies, some of them were, didn't allow citizenship or, or didn't allow full citizenship and full participation for people who are part of minority religion. So that's number one that we have to be really clear on here, that that's the sort of thing we definitely don't want to return to. And so when people are talking about, oh, the good old days, 
we, let's let's be let's be clear. <laughs> so that's important. Um, number two is, uh, you know, for the again, the people who are the loudest, who, who cry the loudest about religious freedom, they don't mean f- religious freedom in the sense that the overwhelming majority of Americans mean it. They don't mean religious pluralism. They don't mean the freedom to do their own thing. We want you to be able to practice your own religion. We want you to be able to acknowledge your own faith traditions, your celebrations in the public square, but it has to be pluralistic and it has to be the government not picking favorites, not picking winners and losers, not taking a side. And that's unfortunately not what we always have. And so when we push back, when we say, listen, you know, the government can't just say Merry Christmas and then nothing else, even though, you know, Christmas is sort of a universal holiday that lots of non-religious people celebrate. I celebrate Christmas. Um, <laughs> a lot of Jews celebrate Christmas, you know, <laughs> so, um, but it, at the same time, uh, the, the the stakes on are we calling it Christmas or winter break or whatever are a lot lower than the message that it sends of exclusion when the government is picking and choosing, you know, are they going to fly a, a flag with a cross on it uh, from city flagpoles? Are they going to put a cross up on city property? Are they gonna put in God we trust on every flat surface that's owned by the government appears to be the the latest thing. Um, That sends a really profound message of exclusion and non-full citizenship to the almost one third of Americans who are non-religious or the uh, 15% or so who don't believe in God and are are not, are are atheists, agnostics, humanists and whatever. And certainly to religious minority groups. I mean, you're not just talking about um, you know, those of us that are non-religious, you're also talking about people who are Muslims, Buddhists, Sikh, Jewish. I mean, you're talking about another tens of millions of Americans who, who are receiving this message that the government is not for them, that, that they're not welcome in their communities. And that's a really damaging thing. I mean, we have some really strong research that indicates that people who have to hide their faith or that face, you know, stigma or discrimination because of their lack of religious beliefs, that that has a very profound and negative effect on mental health including on loneliness, depression, and a whole host of other metrics. Um, And that's really damaging to people. And they shouldn't have to worry that their government is going to be picking winners and losers on this stuff. Um, That's not the kind of country that I want to live in. And it's certainly incompatible with uh, the Constitution, as I think most of us understand it. And as, you know, we've been talking about here, just runs counter to our values as Americans and as people. And and we, we want people to feel free to express this stuff and free to be their whole selves, but we don't want the government elevating it and choosing for us because that's that's not the United States that I wanna live in. This whole um, movement talking about religious freedom has really co-opted the meaning of the constitution. And I think we need to be really clear about that because as this has evolved over the course of the past couple decades and really creating victims that um, were not intended to be the the focus of of um, the Constitution. That it, it it's um, I I really find it uncomfortable when people say my religious freedoms are being trampled on because they're distorting what the Constitution is. When you think about religious freedom and the ability to to practice whatever religion you want is a personal choice. When you put that into the public square, that's a whole different ball game. And so I don't like to talk about it in terms of religious freedom because it's been misused. And we need to be careful about perpetuating the use of that term um, in that context because it's just not constitutionally founded. As Jews, I think that we as a people have um, have a particular focus on separation of church and state because of the persecution that is so prolific in our history. And the ability to live in a society where there is pluralism and there is acceptance and there is not a dogma from the top of government about how you should live um, is part of our lived experience. And, and it, it needs to be thought about in the way that the Constitution meant it to be, that you can practice your religion, but that doesn't mean imposing your views on others in the public. And so the, the um, secular humanistic Jewish movement has actually um, an organization that it affiliates with the Secular Democracy for America for that very reason, because it is a very 
um, visceral kind of issue for the Jewish people, um, regardless of what our beliefs are on that spectrum. Um, and so I think as our country tends to go down this path of religiosity being very absolute and very definitive, it, it makes these issues become more confrontational. And in the process, forgetting about what I do think the constitution meant, and that is the pluralism um, that allows for people of all different types of thinking, types of being or whatever, are able to live together under one roof. Well, that's a, that's a very good additional point made there. And certainly we hope that uh, by your wonderful participation in this and sharing of your perspectives and wisdom on that, that people are a little bit more open. It may be in ways that they have not been in the past. So Nick and Judy, I thank you both very much for participating in this program. And we thank all of you out there for watching this episode of Challenge 2.0 and hope you join us again next week. Thank you very much. If you've enjoyed this program, found our conversations to be informative, entertaining and thought-provoking and the vision inspiring of people from different backgrounds who can disagree without being disagreeable perhaps you might consider supporting our program with a contribution your support will not only help our program continue it will also support the broader efforts of past understanding our supporting parent nonprofit organization